Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Conversations with Courageous Cancer Warriors, and I'm really excited to introduce our guests today. Patrick Long is an author of a book called Ordinarily Extraordinary, and this book has received outstanding reviews and feedbacks by so many people. He has five-star reviews on Amazon, and he's even had Mandy Moore personally contact him to say, like, it's amazing what he's up to. Um, so to give you a little bit the book, a little bit of background, the book is a memoir of his wife, Melanie, and her uh, battle with breast cancer. And he talked in the book, he talks about love, anger, life, death, hope, and inspiration, and how this journey with Melanie really affected their lives. So Patrick, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. I'm really happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about um, your journey and how you got to where you are today. So um, the main part of our journey and our story is, you know, my wife got diagnosed with breast cancer in, in 2015. And actually yesterday was the anniversary of her diagnosis, um, interestingly. But um, so she actually passed last year in March of 2019. Um, and after she passed, I... I've wanted to be a writer my whole life. I've actually written two books before this, which I haven't published yet. One of these days I will. Um, mm -hmm. But this was the first book I published. And what happened was, you know, having that bug I've had for my whole life, wanting to be an author, and it's been a dream of mine. After she passed, you know, I, I started off, you know, I was in the grieving process, so it was hard. But I, I wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to leave more for our kids. That was the very first motivation. We have four young children. And yeah, I want to leave more for them to know their mom <clears throat> and us and me too and our story. And, um, you know, I, I started off kind of like journaling, writing notes, you know, I thought mm -hmm. about like writing or writing longer letters that I put away for them till they're older. But the more I kept getting into it and, and going through the story and, and what it was talking about and learn, you know, over the months, I, I just knew I, it became a thing where I just, it, I knew pretty soon it was going to be a book. I just had to go that route and really dig deeper into the story. And, um, you know, it took me a long time to get going on that, at least a few months after she passed, because, you know, it was just too hard. It was too raw. It was too, you know, um, yeah. I, I would make notes and I'd make an outline of what I wanted the plot to be. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it took me at least a few months before I really found my voice and really, you know, I wrote the first 10, 20 pages probably 15 times, <laughs> kept right. deleting it and starting over. But I, I finally one day just found my voice and uh, really got rolling on writing the book and just, yeah, I'd, every moment I could find to write, I'd find and I'd just go keep telling the story. And uh, it, it took me several months, but I got the book written and then, you know, as crazy as it was in the age of COVID actually went and took the leap and published it. <laughs> so. That's amazing. I, I absolutely love that. So what, um, would you be willing to share, you know, uh, one facet of what's in the book, like an, an experience or a, a memory with us? Yeah, you know, a couple of phrases I always fall back to, I'm talking to people about it is, you know, when you first hear what the story is, you know, it sounds like, you know, it's a cancer book, right? That, that's what people almost kind of think or how it sounds. But I always tell people it's, it's not really a book about cancer. It's a book about life. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is framed around the last, uh, basically, but a a few weeks before she passed, she started having strokes after a three and a half year battle with cancer. And that's where the story picks up. Um, okay. Within that, um, you know, one of the things I realized and I've come to believe is it, the battle with cancer is the worst part of it isn't the cancer itself. It's, it's like how cancer amplifies everything else in your life. You know, mm -hmm. everything becomes magnified, good and bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, know, you go back and look at your own life and what it's meant and things you've done and how you've grown and then your relationship with each other and even what you're going through while you're going through it, you know, like you have a lot of dark thoughts and feelings at times, you know, and yeah. some very selfish things, you know, as a caregiver or as, you know, the person who actually has the cancer. And um, I got real about that, you know, and that's one of the things that really the part of the reason I get such amazing feedback on this is I went into myriad different parts of our life, all, all within the context of telling the story. There's backstory there that, yeah, I picked things that were relevant to let both the reader kind of know who we were and get to know us, but also to highlight things that were going on as we were going through that battle right. um, and, and put them into context and put them into perspective. But, you know, it goes back into some childhood turmoil I had. I kind of grew up with an inferiority complex in my, 
you know, after I got out of high school, I had a really tough time and really kind of failed at college for a while and got into some self-destructive behavior before I finally kind of turned myself around. And I reflect on that as it's relevant to telling the story. And I get very honestly into like marital turmoil that we had mm -hmm. and things like that, <clears throat> that, you know, some of the things I shared in this were kind of secrets and some of it I didn't want to share. It was really hard to do because honestly, there's some things like I mentioned just a little bit ago that you can get into some really selfish and dark thoughts when you're going through different times of stress and all this. And I shared those too. And I was really afraid. One, I didn't want to do it because it's just painful to do in a way. Two, I didn't want to do it because some of it honestly kind of, I felt would make me look like a jerk. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't yeah. want to use a harsher word than that, but uh, uh, um, <laughs> uh, I really was, I was afraid to share it. I thought, what are people going to think of me that they know I had these thoughts and feelings, but the more I kept doing it, you know, I actually deleted some of those things multiple times. And then I was like, mm -hmm. no, it just needs to be in there. Cause I, I want my kids to have a realistic outlook on life. You know, I don't want to be that person who acts like, oh, when you're going through it, it's all about them. It's not all about them. It's about you too. And I wanted those honest things because too often people don't tell you that, you know, right. hardly anybody ever does. And, you know, it, it's a lot of those ooh moments where you just can't believe. And, it, but the funny thing about it is as much as it scared me to share those things, it's been the opposite. Like, those are the things that have actually resonated with people the most. I, Absolutely. I, just, I get people coming back being like, I I'm glad I'm not the only one who thinks that way or feels right. that way. And people are thanking me for sharing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just really amazing the feedback I've gotten because I wasn't expecting it to be. Honest. I, I knew it was a powerful book and I knew it was a good book, but it's really just grown bigger beyond me than anything, you know, I've ever expected and what it would be. Yeah, and thank you, you know, um, on behalf of everybody for just being vulnerable, but also being courageous in sharing this information. You know, we talk a lot about the taboo stuff on this program where, um, you know, going through the treatments is going through the treatments, right? Like you right. just kind of go from one appointment to another and you kind of get in robot mode and like you hate certain aspects of it, pretty much all of it. Um, but it's not until when your treatments are over that a little while later you sit with where you are and what your thoughts are and like the emotional baggage that comes with it right. and a lot of times we choose to stuff it down right we deal with what we have to deal with but then like you said those negative thoughts the things that you um don't want to reveal to anybody you know are right there they're right there they are um you know they are so real, they are so raw, and they are in your face. And they, no matter where you turn, like you're kind of forced to deal with them, or you have to get in, find an escape route, right? It's kind of how I like to call right. it. Right. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about is um, sexuality, intimacy, and about how a lot of times people are not faithful, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those things that I find myself saying, which I surprise my younger self of, you know what, people just react in the way that they react. And it doesn't mean that they're bad people. It's just, right. it's how they are able to handle what's happening to them in their life, right? So we sometimes hear a lot about um, infidelity, whether on both sides, right? Whether it's the patient or the caregiver or whatever. Um, and a lot of people will pass judgment in a negative way and, and it's okay. But for me, what I'm trying to say here is like, for me, it kind of having gone through this, this experience, I've allowed people just more space mm -hmm. to react how you're going to react. Um, you know, give them grace and like, you know what, you're human too. And this is affecting you too and not be so quick to pass judgment as to why their behavior was their behavior. And that's what I hear from you is that like you recognize some destructive behaviors or behaviors that um, were happening that were kind of out of your control. And it, would you like to share any of that with us? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, one, um, I think, a, a, yeah, a big issue we had, you know, is just with us supporting each other in that. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, our biggest, the biggest problem we ever had personally in our relationship was I've always kind of been an entrepreneur, even what I'm doing right now and publishing this book and getting out there. I mean, once you get it written, now you become kind of a businessman. You're out there trying to 
you know, sell it, get it going. But um, mm -hmm. I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit and I'm a risk taker. My wife was the exact opposite. <laughs> and, and this became the biggest source of turmoil we ever had. And yeah, I share this story in the book because it's highly relevant. You know, there was a time kind of late in her cancer journey where we had a huge fight and this all kind of came out. And um, it was kind of funny because like, like the word support with each other almost became like a taboo for us. Mm. And, and the word support, because we both kind of felt like we weren't supported by one another. And yet we both were supporting each other. And one of the things I took from that and I learned is these things are so complex, e every aspect, including this one, you know, there's so many layers to it. But one of the things I learned is support, you know, there isn't just one way to support a person. There's a lot right. of ways to support them. And she did support me in a lot of ways. And she would sometimes ask me when we get in fights and I'd be like, you're not supporting me. She'd almost get mad. She'd ask me like, well, what does that look like to you? Right. And I almost feel stupid sharing this because literally she was asking me this for 15 to 20 years <laughs> yeah. of our relationship and our marriage. And, and I could never really put my finger on it, which makes yeah. me feel stupid now. Like, how did I not know? But in the middle of this fight, it just hit me. And I realized, you know, she didn't get excited about anything I did and she didn't really believe in it. Yeah. And, and that really hurt me like the biggest thing I probably would have wanted in my life was someone you know to believe in me and just support me and get excited about the things I was doing and but she was such a non-risk taker and just wanted the nine to five job and the steady pay you know kind of thing that you know it, it was a huge I can't explain to you what a huge and so coming out of that and I share this in the book was I, I was at this point where I was just so completely disenchanted with our marriage, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I was I was sitting there seriously considering divorce and having some more thoughts than that. Yeah, and uh, I really get into that in detail in the book. Um, but it's, uh, I, and then you feel like a complete jerk. So I'm like, well, here's my wife who's in the middle of you know a three year cancer battle, and we got four kids to support, and I'm thinking about like leaving her. Right. And and, and you know it got to the point it was probably the most serious I'd ever thought about in my life and I'm sitting there processing like not just whether or not I wanted to this or that but you know just stupid things like well what are people in the community going to think about this <laughs> you know like right I I'm going to be viewed as the biggest asshole in the world who left my wife in the middle of her cancer battle but you know and ultimately I didn't want to I mean it but the other side of that is digging so deep into that and and having those thoughts and feelings and acknowledging them mm -hmm. actually kind of taught me how much I didn't want to lose her yeah and it, it, it and that's the thing I think yeah I've come to have this little phrase now I, I think in my head all the time where I'm like if you really want to have a beautiful life you have to dig into the ugly that lurks within 100 percent. you have to pull these things out you have to process them and I not only did it at the time that happened and, and I enjoyed my time with her the rest of the time we had because we went through that yeah. even more because I, I realized how much I didn't want to lose her. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, and then dealing with it afterwards and all the grieving and the process after she passed and then writing the book because it made me go back through it all again and rethink it and discuss it with friends and family and, you know, all, all that, that process of going through, don't, don't hide and shy away from your thoughts and feelings, embrace them, dig into them, because what you're ultimately going to find, I think, in the long run is they're, they're going to empower you. They're going to show you how good your life actually is when you really process them right, I think, you know, at least most of the time. Some things may not, but most of the time it will. Yeah, and, you know, we're so hard on ourselves, too, right? Like, we're yeah. human, and everybody has thoughts and feelings, and they change over time. Some things right. that work for you before may not work for you now after going through an experience like this. Mm -hmm. um, and as a caregiver and as a spouse and not being the person going through the treatments, you know, it's difficult because one, you don't want to see them going through this stuff. Right. And two, like there, I'm sure there's, you know, some anger and some resentment and, and everything of, you know, nobody planned on it to happen, but you still have feelings around it. So how did you manage that? How did you work through those? Oh man, there's so many different ways and it's hard, but um, you know, and, and you're exactly right. And there's, there's another little phrase I always have in my head that I think about is that you can't always control the thoughts and the feelings you have, mm -hmm. but you can control what you do with them. You can yeah. control how you process them. And again, just trying to learn from them. But, mm -hmm. and then the other thing is sometimes whether you learn something from it or not um, per se, it's just, give yourself some grace. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah you're going to have bad thoughts. And honestly, actually you should, 
because yeah. there are times like, you know, there are times I felt totally selfish and like, why is this happening to me or, or what am I going to do in the future? You know, here, right. when I, <clears throat> especially as we got really late in the thing, when you realize or when she passed and you realize it's just me now and I got to raise our four kids who are young. Yeah. Um, and now I realize too, like, you know, you are in this alone to an extent, no matter how great your marriage is or your relationship is, you, you, you are your own person and you're the one who ultimately has to live your life. So I, I think it would almost, sometimes you feel bad having selfish thoughts, but you actually need to have them and you should, because yeah. you do have to process those things and you do have to live your life. Like I am now living without her. You know, yeah. so it, it now looking back on that, it highlights the fact that, well, yeah, I had to think about what am I going to do if she's gone or how am I going to deal, you know, or right. all these different things that at the time you almost felt guilty about thinking because you felt like you were being negative and you shouldn't think it. Um, right. And so many other things, not just that, but uh, yeah, um, a- absolutely. It's just, it's just there was a thought of- I had that I just lost, but <laughs> maybe it'll come back to me later, but absolutely like. Yeah. Oh, you know, the thought I had is it, it, here's another big lesson I learned and a thing I think about all the time is as much as it sounds romantic and great in like movies and stuff to say, you know, you complete me or you're my soulmate. No one completes you. And I feel like these kind of perspectives are so important to have. This is like something I, again, so one of the realities of life I wanted to share with my kids, because what happens is like I was talking about with my wife and her sporting me and me sporting her and how that was such an issue for us. I think if you think someone's going to complete you or you have these greater expectations of what they can be for you, Mm -hmm. that's when you can get hurt the most because then somebody's, you're setting them up to let you down and then you're setting yourself up to get hurt by that. So honesty and and proper perspective and expectations on things is just so important. I I can't agree with you more. And that's kind of where I was coming from with, you know, people are going to do what they're going to do in order to get themselves through their suffering. Right. And who are we to pass judgment on them that if that's what they need to do? Um, right. You know, one of the things is as a spouse, you're, you know, as a caregiver, um, you're still normal, right? I mean, how I mean that is you still have your needs, you still have your desires, you still want to feel loved and, and cherished and taken care of. And it, what's hard is as a, a, a person going through the battle, like that's the last thing on your mind because you're thinking about, am I going to die, right? So, you know, I was literally having this conversation yesterday. So it's really funny that this is where we're resonating. You know, you have to be responsible for yourself. You have to be responsible for your thoughts, your behavior, and and what you allow, what paths you allow yourself to go down. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, like you said, you have to go through down that, those dark thoughts and paths to get to the other side of it. Because right. if you keep stuffing it down, it's always gonna be there. It's gonna be in the space. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, body confidence. And as, as a person who feels mutilated, like how do you even love on somebody when you feel, when you're not loving yourself? And you have to do the work. You have to take the steps to move forward. And that's what I feel is so amazing about what you're saying. And I truly value it is that you took the time to do the work. You had the hard conversations. You saw the truth about it because you're right. I mean, even without dealing with something like cancer, like relationships are hard. It's hard. And especially when you, you are committed to somebody and over time you evolve as a person, they evolve as a person and you still try to find that connection So I admire that you took the stand to be like, look, this is where I'm at. And we're able to vocalize that because I think that's a missing for a lot of people. Like they're not willing to make themselves vulnerable at a time where the barriers shouldn't be up, especially when going through something like cancer. Yeah. Right. I mean, you're in it together. Everybody's affected. So. Absolutely. I mean, I agree absolutely with everything you said. There's just so many thoughts on it. And, you know, and that's the interesting part, just to kind of highlight that or expand on it a different way, even some of the things you're saying about, you know, whether it's infidelity or just different, you know, challenges and problems in your behavior. I mean, even it's crazy because like even after she passed, like for months to come, 
it was hard to even think about like dating or anything. You almost felt yeah. guilty because there's even a, a part of it where you're like, I mean, dealing with grief and loss, like there's part of it where you're like, did this really even happen? And you feel like they're still kind of around. And then it's hard to even think about, can I, you know, when's it okay to go date again or go, right. you know, whatever. And, you know, even months later, I mean, it's been a year and a half plus and you still, I mean, they, the feelings fade over time. They're not as strong, but you still, some of those things are still questions in certain ways in your mind. And Right. Yeah. I mean, and the other thing, like you said, like, we, you know, we kind of have the theme of you, you kind of made some comments at this point of, you know, we're all our own people. And again, like, like I said, no one really completes you. And there's a little mm-hmm. way I have a look at that. There was a movie about, it's a sports movie about baseball players and scouts. And they talk in that movie about how like no player has all the skills you want a player to have. Right. You know? If there's five main skills in a baseball player, like hit, run, throw, whatever, you know, the best players have three of them you know, once in a century, a guy comes along who has all five, right? And I think about that and I think, well, that's the same thing in a relationship or a marriage. Right. No one, again, completes you. Like if there's eight things you really truly want out of your relationship or your marriage, you're lucky if you get five or six of them. You're not going to get eight. And if you have this idea in your head that you're going to, you're just going to be let down. Yeah. And I, I think that's where a lot of like relationship problems and divorce and things might come from is when people have these expectations that they're going to have all these things and then they don't and they're just disenchanted. They think, well, this wasn't the right part, but it's not like the grass isn't always greener on the other side of the fence. You're not, you know, no matter who you, you know, end up with in in a relationship or life partner, there's going to be something that's missing, you know, and probably at least two or three things that are missing and dealing with that, honestly, and looking at what it is and how it affects you is just so important. Like you just, every aspect you know you just that's the kind of thing you have to do you have to have if you have false or you know unrealistic expectations about anything it's just going to hurt and let you down later and that's when you create your biggest problems yeah you're you're setting yourself up to fail right 100 right. and you know we talk a lot about um setting yourself up to win here on this program mm. so what is one of the things that in hindsight what is how what was one of the ways that you set yourself up to win um, I did a few. I, I think also my wife set us up to win. <laughs> mm-hmm. we, we still benefit from her because Melanie was an amazing person. She was one of those rare souls who could just make a friend anywhere, anytime. Um, yeah. And she had more friends than anyone I've ever known. I mean, I would joke about it. I'd be like, you know, when we go out with friends or do stuff, I'd be like, well, you have 4,000 friends. I have four. You know? <laughs> but she, I mean, and just, just throughout her life, even in the end, she would go into the hospital two weeks before she passed and she's dealing with all this horrible stuff and she'd be sitting there talking to people and asking them questions about their life and making it all about them and we'd walk out of the hospital and she'd have like three numbers a new friend she made who wanted over her to call them and she was just constantly doing that and the the value of that I see now is you know in just relationships and community um our community has been so extraordinary to us you know from the beginning even you know while she was going through treatment after she passed people just coming over and doing stuff for us, showing up and, you know, <clears throat> whether it's mowing our lawn or bringing over toys and snacks for the kids or meal, you know, just, and, you know, it slows down over time, but we still get mm-hmm. some of that here or there. And, you know, and a lot of that is because people loved her so much yeah. that they want to give back, not only to her, her family, to her kids, you know, cause they just love them. And, and it just shows you like how much we're all better together and I think one of the big things, so now that I've been on the other end, I realized like I never have in my life the value of like community and relationships yeah. and friendships. And not only that you have that value, but also, and this is something she would talk about back in the day, you know, she used to have this term about like casual friendship or kind of occasional relationship. And she used to talk about this with me. She's like, because sometimes there'd be a feeling like if you kind of felt like you went out and met someone and you connected with them and mm-hmm. then you didn't get closer with them like they didn't invite you to their next party you know you get all hurt and she kind of taught me to like don't worry about that stuff just value the relationship you have with people even the casual ones yeah. you know and just take it for what it is and yeah th- that that bigger branch of relationships and realize you know everybody doesn't have to be your best friend to have a relationship right Absolutely. you know and just to accept that and keep giving back to people when we all just connect and are kind to each other and nice and care about each other 
even if we don't know each other that well, it just makes a huge difference. And, you know, now, now that I've been through it and I've benefited from all that, it makes me want to give back more. If I see people in the community going through something or, you know, I want to go do something for them because I realize how much it means and how much it helps, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And what was your favorite thing about Melanie? Um, there was so much. I mean, we, we were the couple, we could just have fun, anything we were doing anytime, anywhere. Um, yeah it didn't have to be anything nice or fancy. We could just go on a road trip and drive around her. But, you know, the other thing, I think the thing that amazed me the most about her was the way she could connect with people and make friends. Yeah. You know, um, a cu couple of people I was talking to around the time she passed, I remember we were talking about how they'd come up to like the hospital or call her to see how she was doing. Mm -hmm. She would make the entire conversation about them and what was going on in their lives. <laughs> And they'd talk to her for 20 minutes and then later they'd be like, and then I realized I'd called to see how she was doing because she's right. the one who has cancer and we never even talked about her. Right, you know, right. She was so giving as a person. I love that. And it just made people love her so much and you just realize <clears throat> how much that matters and how much it makes a difference in other people's lives. So when you're going through the trenches and you, you, you know, we all get to a point where we're just tired, right? Oh, yeah. How did you keep moving forward? You know, a lot of things. I mean, obviously, as a parent, you know, you, you got to be there for your kids and you love them mm -hmm. to death. So you just, you know, you do that, you know, and just, I, you know, I have a couple of things probably I would always lean back on to just, you know, give me hope and inspiration about the world around me. And, you know, like you could say big picture, but I sort of have a timeline approach of kind of looking at humanity in the world that, and I, I literally, like, this is one of those anchors I reflect on and I think about, because you can get really down in a moment, whether it's your own personal life or watching the news and all the bad things happening, but just realizing how many more good people there are in the world than bad or how much more good than bad in general. And yeah, I look back on how humanity used to be and how far we've come. And there's yeah. so many examples of that in terms of technology, in terms of relationship, how people, I mean, just in my lifetime, in a few decades, I just seen, I've seen people just become so much better, you know, from just the past generations where I think there was a lot more anger in them and this and that. And we just, we do so much better. And when you look at the big picture of the world around you and realize how that's true, you realize how we just keep improving. Yeah, you know, we just keep getting better in almost every way. And the other thing is to, to you know, lean on the resources around you. You know, absolutely. absolutely. There are so many, not only community, but there's so many places, organizations out there ready to help, whether it's counseling, whether it's, you know, um, two of them that are near and dear to us, one's the American Cancer Society, mm -hmm. which we got involved in from very early on. And we're just been big advocates and supporters. I still fundraise for them and everything else. And, you know, the, the services they provide, the cancer research they do, it's mm -hmm. all so important. And we got so much out of them. They had a hotline. And when Melly first got diagnosed, she was on that hotline calling them every day, like trying to figure out what can I do about this? Where can I go for this? And it was so helpful. So lean on those resources and then give back to them because it makes you feel good. But another one, there's a place called Camp Kesem, K-E-S-E-M. And they're a camp that's run out of colleges and universities. They're in like over 130 colleges and universities around the country. And they're, they're a camp for kids who have a parent with cancer. Mm. And our kids were in it from the day she got diagnosed. And there is zero doubt in my mind um, that my kids handled all this a thousand times better because of that. You know, and they, they do not only a week-long summer camp every year, but then they do activities throughout the years. And, you know, kids get to know the counselors. And it's just an amazing, amazing organization. And so my point is not just them, but they're awesome. Um, and both those organizations, by the way, American Camp Society and Camp Kesem have been so huge in our battle in our life that I'm giving back a percentage of all the proceeds from this book to each of those organizations, you know, forever um because in that some way i want to give back and um yeah. but you know whether it's those you know those particular organizations are great there's a lot of other ones out there support groups stuff like that mm -hmm. but lean on those resources don't just sit there in your own head and sit back you know at home and not contact people or use the resources or the things that are available to you because they will make just a huge tremendous difference in your life yeah that's such such great advice because if I learned anything throughout this is that you can't do it alone. You can't right. be a lone soldier. And even if you don't have blood family, there's always going to be the family you choose. Oh, um, there's, you know, yeah. there's tons of people out there who care and love you and want to help, you know, within American Cancer Society, there's a group called Portraits of Hope. 
mm. and it's women who have survived breast cancer. And Melanie was in that the first couple of years after she got diagnosed. And she got to be friends with all the ladies in it. And what's funny is now those women will like to happy hours and things like that. They'll actually call me up and have me come with. I'm the only man who's ever joined them. But oh, I love they, that. They still invite me to some of their like events or happy hours or activities when they're doing stuff. And I go along and I'm one of the girls, you know, like just <laughs> hanging out with them. And it, it's funny, but like, that's the whole thing. Even within those organizations, it's not just the organization itself, even the other people around it, you get to know and they become friends of yours. Right. I've you know, made some amazing friends through this yeah. journey. Yeah. You, you, build, you build a huge network of people, if, if, you know, and even if you're not the most outgoing person, you can still do it. Right. Like I said earlier, everybody doesn't have to be your best friend. Just enjoy it for what it is, you know. And what would be something that you would tell caregivers? What would, if you can tell them one thing besides all the gems that you've given us already, I mean, what would it be? Don't, I mean, maybe the biggest thing is don't be afraid sometimes when you need to, to make it about you. Because, mm. you know, <clears throat> as a caregiver, it's never about you. You know, almost never. I mean, most people don't recognize, you know, you're not the one who has cancer and everybody focuses on the one who has cancer. Right. But this takes a huge toll on you too. And it's okay sometimes to worry about you yeah. and be selfish or go talk to people and, you know, don't just be like, oh, you know, it's because this person's suffering because they have the cancer. You know, sometimes it's about what do you need? What, yeah. you know, what are you going through? Because it, it does, it takes a huge toll on you. You know, you're right there for every surgery, every treatment, and all the stuff that goes on, you know. It's, and, um, it's a huge <clears throat> burden to take on. Re you know, reach I, out I don't... be honest and don't be afraid to be a little bit mm -hmm. selfish at times. Yeah. And I don't know if the word burden is the right word, you know, but it's a huge task to take on. Um, and I agree with you. I've been on both sides and um, I, I really feel that being a caregiver is hard, is harder, is harder. There's, it's just very different. You know, as a patient, you feel like I don't want to die. And that's your whole focus. Like, what do I need to do in order to keep myself alive? But as a caregiver, you're kind of helpless because you can't really do anything other than be supportive. Right. So you try to do as much as you can and sometimes that's more than what the person is doing for themselves right. you know and it, yeah. it's it's kind of you need to keep that balance and i agree with you like you're your own person individual and you have to keep your health um right. and your well-being in in the forefront too and, you know and a great example of what you're saying that sometimes it's harder on you almost yeah you know, my wife had mm -hmm. ended up over three and a half years of treatment and ended up having to have multiple surgeries mm. you know on top of she had a very aggressive cancer. So for her, yeah. like it just never really went away. Um, and so she was, off, you know, she did chemo, then she did radiation. She had double mastectomy. Well, that alone and like the care you have to give for them, yeah. you know? So yeah, she had the surgery, then she's laying in bed and then and that's hard on her. She's recovering. But at the same mm -hmm. time, I got to take care of her. I got to take mm -hmm. care of all four of our kids, still work, still, you yeah. know, that's a exactly. lot to put in. You're the one kind of doing everything for a while, really. You know, it's, that's not to say it's not hard on her. Obviously, she's hurting and she's recovering, but there's so much put on you. I mean, really, yeah. it, it, and some of that is harder because you're now everything. You're mom and dad and, mm -hmm. you know, you're taking care of her too and, and taking care of everything else, the household. You have, you're the one who has to do all the laundry, all the dishes, everything else too. You know, yeah. um, kids have to be fed. <laughs> You know, exactly you, that stuff doesn't stop nothing stops because you you know somebody has cancer like everything mm -hmm. you still have to do in your life still goes on and then there's even more to deal with so absolutely you know, you know again open yourself up to resources and whatever you need and be selfish when you need to be because you got to deal with that you got to get through it yeah I mean I remember because I also had a double mastectomy and it was one of those things that I didn't know what I was in for right and it was you know we joke around about it now um, my family and I, where I'm like, I don't remember three weeks of my life. I was on so much medication that I literally had conversations. I literally watched full series like on Netflix. I watched movies with people sitting next to me. And like a couple of weeks later, I'm like, oh, you know, I just, we really should watch this movie. And they would look at me and be like, we did. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so, especially in that time frame where, uh, you know, like you said, she's in bed recovering. Like that burden is on the caregiver because we don't 
kind of even know what's going on, right? right. Like it sounds yeah. terrible, but right. it's really the truth. And like you had, you know, I needed help taking a shower. I needed help to do all these things that I couldn't do alone. And I don't remember half of them, yeah. right? And I, I know the, it. and and you're absolutely right. The burden is is huge on you know your loved ones and and your family and your caregivers. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that. And I agree with you. Like, it's not being selfish. It's just self-care, you know? Right. Um, and, and so- you, and, oh. and One other quick point is you got to realize it's not just about you. Even sometimes you almost need to be selfish to not be selfish because, you know, like in my case, it's it was about the kids. Like if I didn't take right. care of myself, I couldn't be there for them the way I needed to. Right. So, you know, it's kind of like, you, you know, it's not- it's not just about you, but yet it is about you, <laughs> but yep. don't be afraid to let it be about you when it needs to be about you. you know? Absolutely. And, you know, I always say, make sure to put your own ox oxygen mask on first, right? The airplane's got it right. And, but we need right. to do that in every facet of our life. Like you, it, it's, it's not being, it's not being selfish, it's preservation, right? right. And you, you will be of no good to anyone else if right. you are not at your best. So I mean, I, I truly, um, I love what you're up to. I admire your bravery in, in opening yourself up to and exposing, you know, things that you didn't want to, to the world and, uh, you know, in the, F, in the hope that it'll support someone going through this, something similar. Um, so thank you so much for, for doing that on behalf of this community. Like, Thank you. We admire you for doing that. And we know how difficult it can be. Um, so how can people find you? The best way to find me is just, I have a website, an author website, and it's just www.patrickplong.com. Don't forget the P in the middle, patrickplong.com. And, you know, everything's on there. First, you can you can get the book from there. There's links to go buy it on Amazon. It's on Amazon. It's, it's actually anywhere books are sold. You could go order it through Barnes & Noble but also, uh, or wherever else, but, um, you can also on my website, there's the little social media link icons and stuff that you can go follow me on Twitter, connect with me or follow my page on Facebook or, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn. There's also an e a mail to email link. You can email me directly, sign up for my, uh, you know, alert list, like newsletter distribution list. Um, you can subscribe to that it's right there on the homepage. Okay. Or there's another page for it too. So uh, every way you might want to connect with me is right there. The website has it all, you know, but you know, you can also just find me Google searching or whatever else too. And yeah. So. I love it. Patrick, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This has been amazing. And yeah. I know that people listening will definitely have found value in this conversation. Yeah, and it's a great discussion. And, and you know, one last point, if you don't mind me making no, is- No, please. This is so important to do over and over again. It's so great you have a show on this because, you know, one thing I'm already learning, <laughs> having gone through this journey for a while, is we you can forget, like, you need to not only learn these lessons, you need to reinforce them and remind yourself. Yeah. You know, it's not like you have this kind of discussion one time, and okay, I'm good for the rest of my life. You know, it helps me to have these talks and discussions and hear other people talk, you know, about their stuff or remember what it meant. So you, you kind of reground yourself, refocus and, and right. stay because you, you can lose it and kind of get off track very easily. So this is really important to do. And thank you for having the show because it really yeah. it, it means a lot. It's huge for a lot of people. And, you know, thank you for that, because my my whole purpose is if we could support one person today, then you know, taking this time and doing this was worthwhile. So yeah. I, I truly appreciate that. And, um, you know, we'd love to have you back. And as, yeah. as things evolve and as you get, um, you know, uh, more famous because your book is going to be amazing. Come back, share with us what that journey is like because we also love to celebrate the wins here. And we know yeah. that you've been through some really tough times and, um, you know, thank you for, for sharing with us and, and also like I said, having the courage to share with the world. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd come back anytime. So <laughs> keep me in mind. Absolutely. Anytime. Thanks.